Good afternoon, New York City. Uh, I'm Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I am uh, just genuinely thrilled uh, to be here today with a national hero, uh, and I must say a personal hero of mine as well, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, first, uh, just a very warm New York City welcome to you, Dr. Fauci, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Looking forward to it. Uh, we are as well. Um, before we jump into the questions, though, I did want to take just a couple of minutes to uh, to properly introduce you um, to our audience. Uh, so as, as many of you may know, Dr. Fauci was born and raised in Brooklyn. Um, and if you're one of the handful of Americans who haven't heard him speak yet, you'll quickly understand why he couldn't really hide the fact, even if he wanted to. Um, <laughs> And like any Brooklynite worth their salt, uh, he's enormously proud of his association with his native borough uh, and, and with our city. Now for all the justified attention and praise that Dr. Fauci has received for his leadership during COVID, um, the past year uh, I think is just in many ways, uh, one more leg of an epic life in public health. Um, Tony, you more than anyone know about the challenges, fears, and hopes uh, that come with public health tragedies and breakthroughs, particularly during the HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your reflections on uh, the modern parallels as well. Uh, I have to say the whole country has been drawn in, not just by your brilliance, charisma, your dedication to science, um, but also by uh, what is clear about your underlying sense of empathy and understanding. Um, I wanted to share that the core values of the New York City Department of Health uh, are science, equity, and compassion. Uh, and I can really think of no better example of someone who has lived those values. Um, for those of us uh, for whom you've been a household name for decades, uh, it's been wonderful, if no surprise, to see the rest of the world get to know you as well. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about what we can expect under new leadership, new leadership in the White House, uh, the state of vaccine production and distribution, uh, and other general thoughts about the state of COVID and its short and longer term implications for our health and society. And we'll save some time at the end uh, to answer questions submitted by our audience from all over the city. Um, now, to start us off, uh, I joked a little bit about your Brooklyn roots, um, but uh, tell us, how did your childhood in New York City shape your views, um, your attitudes, and the way that you approach your work? Well, I, I grew up, um, as you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty old, so I grew up in New York City. Uh, you know, and I was born in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn, uh, and that was, as in many areas of Brooklyn is was very ethnic, ethnically concentrated, where most of the people, at least in my neighborhood, were either first or second generation Italian Americans. And it was very much of a family, um, a community spirit where people really cared about each other. They were honest with each other. They had each other's backs. Um, and it was really a, a, a culture that was just open and honest and and caring and and I you know no great tribute to me but I I just was born and raised in that and I I had that um, that spirit and that environment all through my childhood years which I think got me to be uh, very much amenable to the idea about caring for people caring for your neighbor caring for your friends always being honest uh, having your your buddy's back all the time, um, but also a bit of toughness too. I don't mean you know violent toughness. I mean respecting other people, which we did, but never getting pushed around by anybody. And I think that combination of being empathetic to people, being kind and being caring at the same time as being tough enough not to take any guff from anybody, I think is very characteristic of New Yorkers. <laughs> and I just happen to be born and raised in that environment. And I think getting out into the world where I am, a lot of those things, uh, when they become instinctive and intuitive to you, it really serves you very well. Um, so I feel very good about and proud of the fact that my upbringing in the New York City metropolitan area really actually was very important in my development, as was the schooling that I had, you know, with mm -hmm. Jesuit 
training in high school in Manhattan. You know, I had to take that almost an hour plus <laughs> subway ride every day from my from my from my house in Brooklyn to mid uh, midtown midtown East uh, Manhattan, which was good in, in the sense because it gave me uh, a view into another part of the city, another part of how things work. So all in all, it was it was all positive. Well, my my wife is a public school educator, and we're raising our daughter in Queens, and we talk a lot about what uh, what characterizes New York, and I think you you summarized it so aptly. It's that combination of uh, kindness, looking out for one another, with that toughness, you know, that grit, and uh, and actually, I think that's a very uh, unique uh, thing to bring together that that New York City does. Um, well, we're we're very proud, as you know, that you are a native son of New York City. Um, I wanted to connect it to something that um, that Mayor De Blasio mentioned in his uh, State of the City address uh, last night, um, where he laid out a vision of New York City becoming the public health capital of the world, um, building on on the rich legacy of health innovation that you know exists in our city. Um, so I wanted to ask you, as as someone who uh, embodies both New York as well as public health, um, what new directions would you like to see New York City chart as we actualize that vision over the coming months and years? Well, what I learned, you know, from a historical standpoint, when I was going to medical school in New York City at Cornell, right on York Avenue and 68th Street, um, was that the extraordinarily rich history of New York in the arena of public health. I mean, it was, I mean, I, I don't want to be provincial about it because I'm a New Yorker, but it's the truth. If you looked at the public health infrastructure and the systems that existed back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s before, you know, we really did have vaccines for everybody, for children, diseases, where you had tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases and even the very beginning of the HIV AIDS at the at 1980, New York has always been really at the top of its game compared to other big metropolitan areas. But I think across the entire country that there has been an attrition of the support of the infrastructure of the local public health uh, enterprise, if you wanna call it that. So what I would hope to see and I want to make sure this gets interpreted correctly, that in the years ahead, following the extraordinary experience that New York City has had, you know, no one can forget the late winter and early spring of 2020 when the epicenter of this horrific pandemic was right in the New York metropolitan area, that we can get New York back to where it was in its rightful place as really at the top and the pinnacle of what public health should be. So I, I think that's in the making. I don't think it's too far away. I think when we rebound from this extraordinary experience that we're having, I think the pain and the suffering and the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic of 2019, 2020 is something that's gonna make the New York City health infrastructure better off. Well, we, we really appreciate that and we'll take it as a, as a charge going forward as well. And I think, um, you know, there, there are so many of my staff, uh, the staff of the New York City Health Department, who I know are tuning in, uh, who have been working around the clock, uh, as you know, over the last several months uh, on behalf of, of New Yorkers. And um, it's, uh, it's certainly been a chance for us to think about the reverberations across history of all of our forebears in public health and thinking about how we're gonna write the next chapter together. So thanks for uh, thanks for the inspiration there. Yeah, and one extra thing I just wanted to mention that I, I have to take just a second to really salute the healthcare providers on the front line in the emergency rooms, in the clinics, in the intensive care units, in the hospitals, where you got hit so, so very, very badly. But I mean, everybody knows if there ever was any heroes and heroines in this extraordinary experience that we've gone through. It's the healthcare workers and New York City really showed their best with the healthcare workers. So we should be proud of that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. 
Um, now, Dr. Fauci, I wanted to pivot to our discussion on uh, COVID-19, and I'll just open it up uh, with a, you know, sort of a broad question to begin. Um, could you give us your current assessment of where we are in the pandemic? Uh, and although I know this has been a humbling one to try to predict, um, what do you think we should be expecting for the next, uh, the next few weeks? I think that what will happen uh, is that even though uh, when you look at the numbers, you're seeing that that extraordinary uh, inflection of what we've seen in the late fall, early winter associated with people going indoors, Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas holiday, New Year's, we had a major inflection. We're just starting to see now it's starting to level off and come down. The only issue is that, as you well know, as well or better than anybody, is that there's a couple of week lag between cases, hospitalizations, intensive care, deaths. So we're still going to see a substantial number of deaths throughout the country. You know, we're right at about 430,000 deaths and we still see a few thousand deaths per day. That is going to level off if we can continue to efficiently throughout the country. And that's one of the things that I hope will be sort of the hallmark of where we are now since the Biden administration came in, that the states and the government work together in synergy so you don't have some doing something, others doing another thing, that we continue to go down. That, I think, is the encouraging news. The sobering news is that, as you might expect, these viruses start to adapt to the pressures we put on them and you get selective pressure towards mutations. And we're already starting to see that the more easily transmissible 117 mutation, lineage mutation that was dominant in the UK is now in 28, 29 states in the United States and over 320 people have already been. We already have a couple of cases of the South African lineage in South Carolina. Um, we have the Brazilian one in Minnesota, and we probably have our own set of USA mutations and lineages. So as much as this is great that things are starting to plateau, uh, A, we'll still get the lag with deaths and hospitalizations, but we've really got to put a full court press on getting as many people vaccinated as quickly and as expeditiously as we possibly can. Because we know that if you give the virus an opportunity to freely replicate being an RNA virus, it's going to continue to mutate. Hmm. So the best way to prevent a virus that has a propensity to mutate is to just suppress its replication as much as you can. And the best way to do that is by good public health measures, universal wearing of masks, physical distancing, avoid congregate settings and crowds, particularly indoor, wash your hands at the same time as we get people vaccinated as expeditiously as possible. Thanks for walking us through that. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, what uh, message resonates with me is this idea that we have to redouble our efforts even as we uh, bring to bear even more tools, uh, both with respect to the variants and vaccination. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, more about uh, both of those with you, but um, but I wanted to, uh, to see if there was more that you wanted to share in terms of what you see being different about the Biden administration's plan uh, over the next few months and how we, you know, at the local level uh, should be thinking about how that might change the course of the pandemic uh, over the next few months. Well, there is clearly a plan that is very well worked out and very well articulated in a 101 page document that you can easily access by just going to whitehouse.gov. And, and it's there uh, and it's got seven major components, all of the, some of the things we've already spoken about. But the thing that strikes me is something I alluded to just a moment or so ago was the synergy and cooperation and collaboration between the federal government and the states, setting some goals, you know, trying as best as possible 
in the first 100 days to get all the K-8 to children back to school. First 100 days, get 100 million vaccinations performed. First 100 days, everybody wear a mask. So you're, you're seeing something that was not really uh, implemented, I think, very well before, was often it was like, let the states and the cities be on their own, you know, take care of it yourself uh, versus let the government do it all. Neither of those, I think, are, are adequate. I think you need to have resources, um, a plan, and communication back and forth about where the issues are that need to be fixed. I think the idea about you're on your own, fix your own problems. Of course, you want the cities and the states to be very active in figuring out what the problems are and fixing them, but you got to help them. You know, we've got to get the resources. For example, one of the things that's important is we talk about that we may need to close down bars or not have indoor restaurants uh, dining. If you're going to do that, you've got to support the people who own those establishments or they're going to go under. So you got to implement the public health measure to do it, but you can't let them sink. And that's the reason why we want these relief acts that we talk about that would help in that regard. That's very helpful to, um, to understand as well. Um, I, I wanted to shift a bit to um, going uh, deeper on the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and maybe we can start, uh, if, you're, if you're up for it, to, um, to tell us a little bit about your, your personal experience. I know you were, uh, you were vaccinated uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, tell us what it was like, you know, how did you feel afterwards and, um, and what precautions are you still taking? Okay, no, good, thanks for that opportunity. So I got vaccinated uh, on December the 22nd as a prime. Uh, I got the two dose Moderna mRNA vaccine that is separated by 28 days, four weeks. So I got vaccinated, I believe it was on the 22nd. And the only thing that I got was about eight hours after the vaccination, I felt a little achiness on my arm that I would only feel if I pressed on my arm. Then as the evening went on, it started to ache a little, but nothing that really interfered with any function I wanted to do. It didn't prevent me from sleeping. I woke up the next day, then uh, everything was getting much better. And by the time the end of the day, I'm good. When I got my boost on January 19th, as was expected, I got a little bit of the same ache in the arm, but I did for about 24 hours. I felt quite fatigued, didn't prevent me from doing the kinds of things I'm doing with you, but I had to suck it up as it were because <laughs> I was fatigued. I felt a little muscle ache and a little chill, uh, not shaking chill, but I remember I was in the kitchen of my house and my wife just had a shirt on. I had a sweater and a jacket and I said, boy, the house is cold, isn't it? And she said, no, it's, <laughs> I think you're the one that's cold. That lasted no more than 24 hours. And then the next day after that, everything was fine. So a little ache, a little chill, a little um, feeling fatigued, and then you're good to go after that. That's great. And and tell us a little bit about how, have you changed anything about the precautions, your mask, no. uh, your distancing, anything like that? No, that, that, that's a great question that I get asked all the time. Getting vaccinated is not a free pass to essentially throw out all the public health measures. So when I'm in a situation where there are other people around, of which there are not right now, I would be wearing a mask. Number two, uh, I do avoid congregate settings. And when I am, I absolutely wear this mask all the time. I, I compulsively wash my hands because, you know, when you're dealing with people grabbing a doorknob or putting something down. So I do that. Bottom line is I really haven't changed anything. So let me jump ahead of you because someone said, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, then why the heck did you get vaccinated if you're doing the same thing? Well, it's a very good reason to get vaccinated because A, you protect yourself, you protect your family, and you're a part of the solution to the problem. When we get enough people, and that's, I would say, 70 to 85% of the population vaccinated, 
And we're in that arena of herd immunity where the level of virus is so low in society, then you can start pulling back on some of the stringency of the public health measures. But one of the reasons to keep wearing a mask is that the primary endpoint of the trial indicated that you have a 94 to 95% protection against clinically apparent disease. What we don't know yet is that does it protect against asymptomatic infection? In other words, could you get infected and because you've been vaccinated, you don't get sick, you don't have any symptoms, but do you still have virus in your nasopharynx, which is conceivable, we're gonna find out actually the real data on that in a couple of months. But if that's the case, you don't wanna inadvertently and innocently infect someone else because you don't feel badly, but you have virus in your nasopharynx. So that's the reason why you wear a mask. That point about asymptomatic spreading is a, is a very important one, and thank you for explaining it so clearly. Um, it's also important, as you pointed out, you know, it's not just the first dose, it's not even just the second dose when uh, those precautions have to um, continue being taken, and we'll have to follow the science to understand, um, you know, what we can do uh, in the future as well. Um, I, I wanted to pivot from your experience to uh, maybe speaking, you know, directly to uh, some New Yorkers who I know are waiting um, to hear more about the vaccine before deciding to get it. Uh, and so if you if you had a message for a New Yorker who maybe is on the fence about getting vaccinated, what would be the most important thing that they should know about how they should make that decision? Well, making the decision, um, it relates to the information you have and try and unpack or dissect what the reason for the hesitancy is. One of the things that I think nationally we do face is there are different types of hesitancy and different demographic groups may have hesitancy for different reasons. So when you're dealing with brown and black people who historically cannot and should not forget completely that the federal government in health issues has treated them in, in some respects in a shameful way, apropos of the Tuskegee, the infamous Tuskegee Institute. We've got to get past that, but you've got to respect when brown and black people have a hesitancy because of that. So what we try to do is explain that that was terrible what happened. But since that time, very, very strict safeguards have been put in place that would never allow that to happen again. So A, you respect their concern, but you reinforce that that could never happen again. Once you get past that, then anybody, be it a brown, a black person, or anybody else, you say, okay, what is the reason that you're hesitant? And the most common was it, boy, that went really fast. The virus was just recognized in January, and now all of a sudden you're putting vaccine into people's arm in less than a year. That never has happened before. That's true. It has never happened. But the reason for it is not that any corners were cut. The reason is because we've taken advantage of the extraordinary breathtaking advances in the science of vaccine platform technology. So we did in months what normally takes years but we did it because of scientific advances. The next thing that people ask is, well, how do we really know it's safe and effective? Is that the federal government trying to put something over on us? Or is that the pharmaceutical company, you know, trying to make a lot of money out of this? Well, you let them know that the results of the trial is 30,000 to 40,000 people who are actually in the Moderna and the trial of Pfizer, 30,000 for Moderna, 44,000. But the results were not examined and decided by people with skin in the game. It was done by an independent data and safety monitoring board who looked at the data and determined that it was safe and effective and that the results should be given to the FDA to determine if it can give it to people like you and me. The FDA looks at the data, but they do it in association with their own independent advisory board. So the entire situation of 
finding out if something really is safe and effective is both independent and transparent, that anybody can ultimately see the data. So there's nothing behind closed doors. There's no secrets. Everything is open and transparent. And I think when many people see that and realize it, I think they might be able to change their mind a bit about their willingness to get vaccinated. What, what I hear in your answers, and uh, you know, I, I know you continue to see patients, and it reminds me of my own clinical practice is starting with listening, you know, starting with understanding one's mindset and uh, answering questions based on that understanding. Uh, and, and so thanks for, uh, for speaking to some of the concerns that we know exist. Um, you also touched on on equity, and I wanted to um, go one layer deeper here as well. Uh, first, to share with you one of our commitments at the New York City Health Department um, to, to be an anti-racist organization, centering all of our work uh, around equity. Um, and, you know, you've certainly seen uh, over the last few months the, uh, the tragedy and the suffering of this pandemic has not been uh, born um, evenly or equally across different communities, as you've already alluded to. Um, it is a challenge to affect real change, given uh, some of the deep rooted circumstances, you know, that lead to that inequity. So I'm interested in any practical steps that you would point to for us to take this commitment to equity and turn it into action. Yeah, well, that was something that in the uh, discussion with President Biden and Vice President Harris about um, the strategic plan for addressing COVID-19 and pandemic preparedness is that equity was a prevailing issue on the table to the point that the president has appointed an equity officer whose job is to make sure that equity in every element of this pandemic, from vaccine distribution to resources to what have you, are addressed and always on the front burner. It's Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, who is a highly respected physician from Yale University, who now is working full time in the administration with just that job and just that mandate. So I believe that that really does reflect the seriousness of the president and the vice president in actually making sure that equity is an important issue. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the variants, uh, which you mentioned earlier as well. Uh, so here in New York City, as you may know, we've identified uh, 13 cases of the B117 variant. Um, we have not yet identified uh, cases of the other two variants that you mentioned, the B1351 or the P1 variants. Um, but it's something that we are uh, actively uh, looking for, conducting surveillance for as well. Um, we are, uh, as I know you are, concerned about the variants, but help us put it into context. Um, what should it change, particularly for, uh, you know, for the everyday New Yorker? And how does it change the way that you think about um, the vaccines, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are authorized, uh, as well as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which had its preliminary results shared earlier today? Yeah, a great question. And it has a, a bunch of implications, both for the effect of the virus in the community and the effect of the virus on the vaccines that we've now developed. So one thing people need to understand that it is not unusual or unanticipated for mutations to arise. Uh, RNA viruses and the coronavirus is an RNA virus, have a very strong propensity to mutate. Most of the mutations have no clinical significance, but every once in a while, a mutation or a constellation of mutations will occur that impact a functional component of the virus and also potentially the response of a vaccine to whether or not it can contain it. So let's take a look at some of the mutations that have already been identified and there are likely more to come. So the B117, which has become very dominant in the UK, is here, as you might expect, in the United States because of travel throughout the world. So we have about 320 
cases in about 29 states. In examining it, the UK scientists have determined that it transmits more readily. So that is a challenge because that means we have to really double down on our preventive measures because it's more efficient in its ability to go from human to human. Next, it is somewhat a bit more virulent. We thought not the case, but now they're telling us from their studies that it is. By virulent means it has the potential to make you more sick and even get more serious consequences. The vaccines that we're using now with the UK appear to be handling it quite well, both from the indication of in vitro test tube balancing the antibodies that you induce with the vaccine against this UK strain. A little bit different, in fact, a lot different with the South African strain. Much more formidable because the mutations are evading somewhat the ability of the antibodies that the vaccines that we all get to be able to suppress it. So that's a challenge because the study that just came out today that I was on a press conference like an hour ago uh, was from Janssen or Johnson & Johnson, which had about a 72% efficacy in the United States for mild to moderate disease. But the good news is it had about an 88% efficacy against severe disease, uh, about 85 across the board, including the South African isolate. So even though the mild to moderate infection was not nearly as well controlled by the vaccine, it at least did well against severe infection. That's good news in some respects, but the thing that it tells us is that antigenic variation has clinical consequences. And even though the vaccines do pretty well, relatively speaking, we have to be nimble enough to be able to respond to the inevitable evolution of mutants. And by nimble enough, we mean we've got to be able to upgrade the vaccine so that maybe like I and maybe you have gotten two shots. Many people have, hopefully a lot more will. It may be that eight months down the line, we need a boost that is not the original vaccine, but it's the same type of vaccine, but it's directed against the South African isolate or the Brazilian isolate. So you stay one step ahead of the game with the vaccines. So that's where we are right now with the mutants. Thank you for, for putting that ever-changing uh, science into context. And it's been, uh, it's been so humbling to watch it uh, over the last few months. And I, you know, I think your clear message is we've still got a, a pretty long road ahead of us and we'll have to keep, uh, we'll have to keep being nimble to stay ahead of this virus. Um, well, we only have a few minutes left, Dr. Fauci, so I wanted to turn to um, some questions that we're getting in real time from uh, the New Yorkers who are tuning in. And we'll do this as a, a little bit of a lightning round if you're, if you're up for it, um, some, uh, a handful of questions to, um, to get uh, your, uh, your brief thoughts uh, on you know, some practical advice for New Yorkers. Okay. So here's the first one. Um, I'm confused about uh, the idea of double masking. Should I wear a surgical mask with a double or triple layered cloth mask? What about adding a filter to a mask? What should, what should I be doing right now? <laughs> a great question, source of a lot of confusion. The CDC recommendation is wear a mask. A lot of people ask, well, if the mask is a physical barrier, maybe I should wear two. Uh, you know, if one is good, maybe two is better. The answer is that's common sense, seems to make sense. So there's nothing against doing that, but there aren't enough scientific data for the CDC to say you should wear two masks. That doesn't mean that if you feel more comfortable doing it and safer, then go ahead and do it. As soon as there's enough data about whether you, one mask versus two, this type of mask versus the other, the CDC has not made anything other than their original recommendation, which is wear a mask. A lot of people, and sometimes myself also, would might feel more comfortable. For example, you take one of the surgical masks, and then when you put this on, it fits a lot better. 
So it feels a lot more comfortable. So you might even see me on TV occasionally or on the outside wearing two masks. That doesn't mean it's recommended. It's just that I figured maybe it'll make a difference. So it's up to the discretion of the person. That's helpful. And I'll, I'll just uh, underline one of the things that you said as, as the city's doctor to emphasize that the most important thing is to wear a mask, wear one that fits you well um, and, uh, and you know, wear it properly. So it doesn't work if it's not covering your, mo uh, your nose and mouth. Uh, it won't work on your chin and won't work on your nose. So the most important thing, if you're not wearing a mask, wear one. If you're not wearing it properly, make sure you're wearing it properly. Well said, well said. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question for you. Is it safe to go to the dentist for a routine cleaning right now? Or is it safer to wait until I'm vaccinated? Well, you know, I would say the answer to both, and I'm not evading it, is probably yes, yes. I mean, you obviously you're much better off when you get vaccinated. But, you know, the dentist, at least in the Washington, D.C. area now, and we have infection in the area, are really, really very careful uh, when you go into an appointment. I mean, they space people. They have these um, uh, vacuum type air that keeps blowing air out. They wear complete PPE. Uh, I mean, they really are careful. I mean, I, I think that the dental profession, for the most part, have really done a good job. So I, I would say that if the precautions that I mentioned and the guidelines that they put upon themselves are followed, you could very easily go to a dentist and get whatever work is needed. Great. Thank you. All right. Another New Yorker is asking, um, if I have seasonal allergies, if I'm allergic to penicillin, or if I had a bad reaction to a flu shot, should I still take the COVID vaccine? The answer is yes. Um, if you have had a severe life-threatening allergic reaction and a one that walks around with an EpiPen, that you should get vaccinated, but you should do it in a location where if you do get a severe allergic reaction, that it can be easily taken care of. One more on vaccines. How dangerous is it to delay the second COVID-19 vaccine dose? Um, if if uh, there is a delay for an individual, will it cause a new mutation of the virus to develop? All right. Well, the scientific data upon which the approval of these vaccines was based was 21 days for the second dose for Pfizer and 28 days for Moderna. That's optimal. Sometimes it, out of just logistic necessity, you're going to miss it by a few days or maybe even a week. I don't think that's going to be a big deal at all. Better you do it a few days to a week late than not doing it at all. If you wait a substantial period of time, we don't have any good data to say that that's a good idea. The idea about, um, about if you have one vaccine and don't get the other, would you be partially immune? And then if you get infected, could you then have the virus hang around a bit longer and then mutate? Theoretically, that's possible. Whether or not it will happen in you, no one can tell. But theoretically, that could happen. So we recommend, to the extent possible, stick to the regimen that was the basis for the clinical trial results. Thank you for that. All right, I, just a couple of final questions as we um, approach the end of our time together. Um, first, you know, I mentioned uh, the staff here at the New York City Health Department um, who have been working around the clock uh, with our, our colleagues in healthcare whom you've recognized as well. Um, tomorrow, I wanted to uh, just mention is the one year anniversary of when we activated our COVID-19 response, which is a little bit hard to hard to believe, um, but something certainly worthy of commemoration. I wanted to invite you, if you have any words of wisdom uh, for our staff, for the healthcare workers around New York City, particularly young people who are watching what's happening with this pandemic, um, you know, what motivates you to keep going and uh, how should we take that to heart? Well, what motivates me is the enormity of this problem and the challenge. And, and, and as much as this is so challenging, when you're in the healthcare uh, activities and you're either a physician, a nurse, or any of the team of healthcare providers, you have an enormous opportunity 
to do so much good in the face of a threat, a serious threat on the health and life of your fellow New Yorkers. So that's the reason why I, I readily and enthusiastically tip my hat to the healthcare workers for the job that they have done and continue to do to safeguard the health of the people in the city of New York. So to me, they are, as I mentioned before, the heroes and the heroines. And for young people, if you're interested in going into medicine or health, it's a very, very gratifying field. If it's not meant for everyone, but if there's a slight chance that it's meant for you, you should investigate as to whether or not that's something you might want to do with yourself. I can guarantee you, if in fact you have an uh, inclination for it, it will be exciting and fulfilling. We're, we're very grateful uh, for that. And I can't think of a better person for that, um, for that call to action. My last question for you, um, Dr. Fauci, do you recommend that New Yorkers get vaccinated? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the way that we are going to just turn down and crush this outbreak. Get vaccinated. The vaccines that are out there right now are highly efficacious and have a very good safety profile. Um, well, look, I, I want to just wrap up by saying uh, thank you sincerely. Uh, we can only imagine um, the demands on your time. Uh, it's so meaningful uh, for you to, to spend some of it um, with us, uh, to answer our questions, to inspire us, and to share your wisdom and your knowledge. So uh, so we're, we're deeply appreciative. I wanted to give you a chance for any closing remarks you'd like to share with New York City. Yeah, well, just thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to interact with the city of my birth. <laughs> I love you all. Keep going. This will end. We will get through it. Just keep just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're doing a great job. And we will come to an end of this and get back to normal. You heard it from Dr. Fauci. We're very proud of you. And thanks again. Thank you.